four decades ago. Yes, I know I don't look that old. <laughs> the universe decided to put me on a journey that was going to fill my life with mystery and intrigue. You see, my mother was very ill. She would get up out of bed only to go to the doctor. She would go to the doctor and she would come home with pills, bottles of pills. For seven years, my mother would get up and go to the doctor and come home with pills. At some point, as a wee nine-year-old, I thought to myself, why are these medications not working? They're supposed to cure her. Why don't I see her getting out of that bed. Well, eventually she did. But I kept thinking to myself, medications need to cure people. They need to help people get better. So I guess that's when I decided that was going to be my mission, my intellectual mission, was going to be to go find new medications for people. And so I decided then to go off to college and become a chemistry major. So I looked around when I got to college. I was excited. I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. There was no one there like me. Now, I went to a historically black college in North Carolina. There were plenty of people around me who looked like me. They shared my race, they shared my ethnicity, a lot of them shared my religion. But very few of them actually shared my very low level of economic and social privilege. They also didn't share my ridiculous passion for making new medications and being innovated and a discoverer. When I recognized that, I said, huh, let me look around and look at my professors. Well, my professors weren't like me either. They were mostly white, male. They didn't share my ethnicity. They didn't share my religion. But they had the privilege of the knowledge that I wanted. So I said to myself, who is going to train Amanda? Then a professor came to me one day and he said, you seem to love organic chemistry. I know there are a lot of people here who love organic chemistry. <laughs> Why don't you come in my lab and do some organic chemistry and make some new molecules? Wow, a dream come true. So he became my mentor. This was a tall white guy from Tennessee. He had a Tennessee accent like you wouldn't believe, but he knew how important it was to me to fulfill the dream I had of being able to treat people, to give new drugs to pharmacists. I didn't want to sell the drugs in the pharmacy. I didn't want to be the doctor. I wanted to make those compounds. So. He recognized that I was very ill-prepared. I felt like I was walking in the fog in a forest all by myself, that there were no people there to help me. So he taught me how to learn. He gave me the resources that I needed. He recognized that I needed experience. So he brought internships to me, and he put me in them. He sat next to me once at a dinner where we had lobster. I had never seen a lobster before in my life. I didn't know what to do with that thing. <laughs> so he said, Amanda, just look around and do what everybody else does. And he helped me learn how to do that. Today, we're all told that we need mentors. Black folks, white folks, young folks, old folks, girls and boys, men and women. But, what are mentors really? That's what I want to talk to you about. What kinds of mentors are there out there? 
And who are these people that you need to help you walk through that path in the fog and find your way? A mentor helps you in a way that no one else can. It's a very personal relationship that is based on trust, understanding, and open dialogue. You owe it to your mentor to make sure that they know the things about you that they need to know to help you be successful. But one of the most important things, your mentor needs to accept you as an individual. And when I say as an individual, I mean someone who has their own mind, their own characteristics. They need to be able to accept the fact that you have chosen to raise children or that you've chosen not to. They need to accept that you've chosen to transition from male to female, female to male. They need to accept that you embrace your own ethnicity, your religion, and your faith. Those individuals have to be on board to accept all of those things about you. They need to know your past. They need to know your present. They need to know where you're going and what drives you and what your mission really is. That mentor is the one that also recognized that as life continues, you're going to change. Your needs will change. And they will be the ones to help you find out what you need next. Now, there are different kinds of mentors. There's that advocate. This is the mentor who is standing behind you on the sidelines they know what you know how to do, they know when you're ready, and they push you into the game to make sure that you get the playing time that you need so that you can show the world how good you are. And then when you start to get all of those wins, because you're out there, you're playing, they know when to pull you back and sit you down in the chair because you need a rest. They are the ones who are there. Now, they're not going to be the mentor who's going to sit down next to you and teach you how to eat lobster. They're not going to do that. But they're the ones who are out there who are advocating for your success. What do advocates do? They work for a cause. When you find your advocate, their cause is you. Now, they're giving you something. They're giving you something. They're giving you time, they're giving you energy, and they're giving you a part of their reputation. This is a major thing. So you have to remember what you owe to your advocates when they are helping you along the way. Now, there's another kind of mentor. This one is your champion. Even when you're not in the room, your champion is talking about you. That person needs to know you incredibly well, and they need to be there to use their intellectual capital, their social capital, their economic capital to get you where you need to go. You need a champion, especially when you've gotten all of those wins and it's time for you to gain recognition. We all want to be recognized, don't we? We all want to get a promotion. We all want an award. The only way that you can do that is to have a champion. Now, you might be asking yourself, she's up there talking about all of these mentors. Why do people need mentors? What is all of that about? You know, I, I did it myself. Did you? I'm going to go back to that question in a minute, but I'm going to talk to you about one other kind of mentor. And that's the challenger. We don't like them. Uh-uh, no. We love to hate them. But they keep you real. They keep you grounded. They make sure that you understand that you owe it to yourself 
to be the best that you can ever be. They are the ones who are out there saying, yes, this person should sit in this seat at this table because they have what it takes. They can help in this situation because they have that background. Those people that we talk about there, they're the ones who are in the room when the discussions come up about the diversity candidate. Let me talk about the diversity candidate for a second. That was me, very often. She's female, she's black, she's in science, there's only one of her, then we need to interview her. That's not supposed to be the discussion. The discussion is supposed to be, she trained in Germany, she knows her stuff, she loves the students. Let's bring her in here and interview her because she is going to contribute. If there is no champion at the table, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. So now we need to talk about why. Why do we need mentors? And if you are actually someone who identifies as a member of an underrepresented group in your community, at your workplace, at your place of higher education, at your school, these are the things you need to think about. Why do you need these mentors? Conscious bias exists. There are people who don't want women at the table. There are people who don't want brown folks at the table. There are people who don't want to see a hijab at the table. There are people who don't want to see someone at the table who identifies as transgender. It's conscious. I got tired a while ago hearing about implicit bias. I got tired because I felt like it was the get out of jail free card. Oh, my biases are implicit, they're unconscious. I'm not thinking, yes, you are. Sometimes you are. Let's be real. A lot of times you're not. All people of goodwill want to believe that they're not biased. But we know. We do have to educate ourselves. We do have to acknowledge. We do have to be aware of unconscious biases. That's very true. But we do have to recognize that microaggressions, they hurt people. We do have to recognize that that pain that comes from being constantly told that you're not supposed to be at the table is painful. What makes a person who feels and sees that every day believe in humanity? They believe in humanity because of your compassion. They meet you and they recognize that you listen with compassion. You teach them with compassion. That is what keeps them going and that is what keeps them out on the road to success, trying to be the best that they can be. Now, in the end, we have to remember one very important thing. It's up to us to find the people that we need on our team. We need trainers who are going to be there to hear us, to love us, to push us, to want us to be there. But it's your choice. You go out, you work hard. Don't have your mentors working harder than you are. You make sure that they can be proud of you because their investment is large. So what I want to leave with you today is the one thing that you do not ever forget. The choices that you make are important. The mentors that you choose are important. The people are on your team are important because you are the master of your fate and you are the captain of your soul. Thank you.